Welcome back to the Diversity in Action podcast, where we amplify the voices and stories of various individuals in and around the community. My name is Yelema Felican, and I have the privilege to serve as the director for the Office of Student Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. In honor of Women's History Month, today's theme is women who advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. In a world where diversity is our strength, and inclusion is our mission, it's crucial to recognize the incredible efforts of those who are tirelessly leading the charge. Today, we're shining the spotlight on a student leader who has been breaking barriers, challenging stereotypes, and advocating for the rights and dignity of all individuals, whether it's advocating for representation in leadership roles, dismantling systemic barriers, or fostering dialogue across diverse perspectives. She's driving meaningful, progress in advocacy and advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Joining us today, we have Aaliyah Sinoff, the first woman of color president for the Fairfield University Student Association, a graduating senior with a public health major and minors in black studies and health studies. We'll have an opportunity to dive into her personal journeys, explore the challenges she faced, and uncover her innovative strategies to affect positive change in her communities and beyond. Aaliyah, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. So you know what? We'll dive right in. Um, And for our first question, I'll just ask if you can share with us your personal journey and what led you to become an advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah, well, I grew up in Queens, New York. So I grew up in an area that was always super diverse. I was surrounded by people that looked like me, that looked different than me, but it was always such a welcoming environment. Everyone was friends with one another growing up. I feel like I didn't experience any type of issues when it came to students looking different than me in school, anything in my neighborhood. Like I always felt safe in the idea that I had community Um, and I think that the first time I was really introduced to the idea that, okay, there's not like this everywhere, um, was when I was in middle school. I feel like, again, before you learn about the usual, you learn about MLK and you learn about that stuff in elementary school. But when I was in middle school, um, it was really such a vital part of our curriculum. We read a lot of books, um, by abolitionists and it was just really embedded Um, for us to learn about this and learn about history, true black history. Um, And I feel like that was when I was first called to make it my passion and really enjoy it. Um, So I felt like I was really introduced to what really happened to the world and social justice and its principles in middle school. So fairly young, I would say. Um, And then when I was in middle school, I also participated in a program, Upward Bound. um, And that was just it, it was really just black and brown students. We used to hang out all summer long and go to a local um, community college in our area. Um, and there we learned a lot about, again, social justice principles, DEI before DEI what it is what it is now. Um, and I was always fascinated by it. It was conversations I had from young with friends that were so meaningful about this type of work. Um, and then once I was in eighth grade, 2016 was when I feel like the Black Lives Matter movement really became a vital like voice and platform. And um, I was just always fascinated by it, always wanted to make change, um, always wanted to stand up for others. It was it was weird how emotionally connected I was to other people um, and their experiences. And it was just something I was always fascinated by. Um, it was always important to me for to be a voice for people, um, even though I grew up actually very shy. But I, I always wanted to help people in any way I can, and it just tra- ended up translating to um, underrepresented individuals, ultimately. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just imagining um, middle school Aaliyah, yeah, no, you know, I was, advocating. I was always <laughs> like this. <laughs> I can see it. I can absolutely see it. Um, and, and as you were sharing your story, you mentioned um, issues, like the word issues came up, right? Like there weren't any issues, you know, um, during that time. So in your experience, what are some of the most pressing issues related to diversity, equity and inclusion um, that you would say women face today? Yeah. So um, bringing in like my interest in public health a little bit, because public health is actually super connected to like social justice work and DEI as a whole. 
Um, and also part of why I like love that field is because I feel like a really big issue that women in particular face um, come with sexual reproductive health rights, um, abortion, um, birth control access, things like that, um, basic access to health care as women. I feel like that's just an ongoing issue um, as well as gender based violence. So that's something I've been really just fascinated about my whole life because coming from a country like my family's coming from a country that's like known for gender based violence and intimate partner violence and things like that. Um, so I've always been called to that area of work, um, sexual violence, domestic violence, things like that. And I just feel like it's such a it's such a global issue, bigger than just what happens in America. And I feel like we're always considering only what happens around us when it's, it's the global impacts are huge. Um, and of course, it's very related to current events and things that are happening now in the world. Um, and I feel like there's no it's hard to find a solution necessarily. And sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I want to change the world and change this and change that. Um, but it's it's like mind boggling sometimes every time you hear about the next new thing that's happening in those spheres. And I again, I've fascinated by women's health because of my interest in DI, DI ultimately um, and how it relates to these things, even in maternal health care and um, black women in America, what they face um, most of like pregnancies by black women in America, it's dead, deathly. Um, and even in comparison to developing countries. So I, I'm really interested in the health aspect of women's lives and women's health um, and things like that. So I feel like all the most pressing issues that matter to me and I'm really, really passionate about and I can speak for days on <laughs> are those. Awesome. And thank you for that. And also thank you for shedding light on not only what's happening here in the United States, right, but also the global issue that um, sometimes we tend to become very narrowly focused on what's happening in the United States, what's happening in front of us. Um, but the issue is so much bigger. And, and something I always say is that it's bigger than you, right? Yes, it's bigger exactly. than what we see, mm -hmm. you know, right here and right that's now. Um, and if it affects us, then imagine how many others it affects Absolutely. and the capacity, you mm -hmm. know, um, that it affects other folks in right. as well. Um, right. So, yeah. So thank you so much for, mm -hmm. for sharing that. Um, so actually before this podcast, we were just talking about just your journey over oh, time. Yeah. Right. Um, the and journey. I, I always laugh cause I'm just like seeing this, you know, first year student in my office to now seeing this senior and just how much you have grown. And just really, for me, it's really reflecting on, um, just again, how much you've grown, right. And your leadership capacities and just the different, different projects that you've been working on. Um, something that I, I mentioned before when I was speaking with you was that your first year was more of like the observation stage, right? Oh, yeah. Like you were kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm here, now what, right? And you were always involved, but your involvement levels definitely changed over time and, and what you've been working on um, has changed over time. Mm -hmm. So with that said, could you highlight some specific initiatives or projects you've been involved in that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, so, well, thank you for recognizing that. <laughs> A lot of the things I've worked on is because of those observations in the early days, so. Um, Everything happens for a reason that way. But um, two things that I feel like I'm really passionate about right now and in my role as president um, that I've like been working on for a long time, I feel like, but it came to light um, now as a senior. Um, one thing being this initiative I worked on through FUSA um, is called the Celebration of Unity Series. And the whole point of this series is to enlighten students, faculty and staff as well, um, on how to celebrate Fairfield's history when it comes to social justice and DEI and how do we grow from it. Um, one thing that I felt in my underclassmen years is when we talked about these topics, they're always it always had to be educational or needed to serve a grander purpose. When I feel like, to an extent, absolutely, everything needs to have a teachable moment. But I wanted us to be able to have fun and celebrate too, just as the next student might be able to. So I wanted to be able to highlight these moments in our history as Fairfield students, um, while also celebrating our accomplishments and what we've done to get where we are now and alumni who've made the sacrifice for current students and things like that. So the purpose of this series really was to make students on this campus, faculty staff as well, aware of, okay, we know what's going on, we know the history, we know what it is, but we're gonna celebrate that we're here now and all the things we've, we've done and will continue to do. Um, so it's one event um, each week in April dedicated to DEI, social justice and capacity. And I started it last year um, when I was vice president. And this year I just want it to be 
bigger and better. So it's coming up soon. But yeah, one of the key events in that series is the Black Stacks Matter Walks. So this is the third year we're doing that. Um, and again, it's used to, yes, let's hear each other's stories and what we've gone through as students, um, as black and brown students at Fairfield. But coming together, too, as a community and like celebrating and owning that this has happened and raising that awareness. So just to give another platform to students to be able to come together again, share that we are going through similar things and have had similar experiences for that matter. Cause I think most students do that <laughs> have come here in these situations and how have we grown from it? And like, yeah, let's have fun. Like, why do we have to make everything so daunting all the time? Um, so that's one thing that I've been really loved and invest my time into, um, just out of my experiences in underclassmen and what would have probably helped me then um, seeing that sense of community. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that has been really meaningful for me this year is um, another initiative I've been working on to have mentor products on campus for free. Um, that's been a long, long time coming. And um, this year we finally were able to get the dispensers that are in women's and all gender restrooms on campus to be converted to free. So you don't have to pay 25 cents, 75 cents, whatever it might be. Um, so to be able to provide them for free, but also better quality products than what we've been using before. So I feel like that there's an access component. Um, this is a this is a health right. This is just something that all women need. It's not about, you know, you need it because you want it. Like this is a need. <laughs> um, so those are two things that have really meant a lot to me this past year that were all reflecting of my experiences three years before. Awesome. That is amazing. So incredibly proud of you and just all the things that you have done. Um, and there are and those are just two things that you've named, you know, and I know firsthand countless other things that you have continued to do. Um, but just some of the things that are on your docket right now that you're that you're working through. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and two very, very important things. Right. Like when you talk about celebration, especially when we talk about communities of color, oftentimes we think about the next thing or we yes. really focus on, you know, the negative things right like what we don't yeah, have right exactly um, and we look at things from sometimes uh we can look at things from a deficit model mm -hmm. um at times but to really look at what are the positives and what can we celebrate and how far have we come yes we know that we still have work to do but where are we right now and what can we celebrate absolutely and simultaneously talking about okay well what do we still need to do how far do we still have to come um and not losing sight of that but also not losing sight of the celebratory aspect of it so Thank you for all of your efforts and for doing that. Um, and then also for the um, access resources that you have provided as well. Because um, I know that you've been talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, that since time. your first year. Yeah, and you were just like, time. that doesn't make any sense. And I don't understand <laughs> why. And, you know, you're saying you were saying all these things. And it's it's literally I'm playing it in my mind right now. Um, but to then do something right to then do something about it. So, again, just thank you for all that you continue to do and all that you have done thus far. Um, and with that said, so we're talking about, you know, celebrating and we're talking about some of the successes and some of the amazing things that you have done. Um, but one thing I know firsthand and I know from you also is that it was not no. easy, right? It wasn't like, I'm just going to do this and it's going to be a walk in the park mm -mm. and it's going to be a piece of cake. Never will be. Right. So when we think about that and we reflect on, you know, those successes and the great things that you're doing, what are some of the challenges or obstacles that you've encountered in your advocacy work and how have you overcome them? Yeah. Um, I feel like growing up, right. Going back to that whole, like I grew up in Queens and my whole spiel I always give. Um, I, I was introduced to how not everyone's going to like you when I was in high school, right. We all experienced that in some capacity and that, never really bothered me. Like the fact, oh, everyone's gonna like me, I need to be liked. That was never really my issue. Um, but it was when people don't like you for things you can't change, such as your identity. Um, and when I was in high school, I felt that a lot because this is, I was president in high school as well, which is a whole other thing a lot of people don't know. I was president soon in high school, so I, I, I love this stuff. Um, but when I was in high school, I, I went to high school away from in Queens, but away from where I live. So it was like an hour away. Um, and it was, it was definitely diverse in the respect that there was equals amounts of all races, all in the cities, whatever. Um, but we, it was in a, it was a predominantly white neighborhood and we had issues there where there were tensions among students because of who they are and their identity. And I was introduced at that time and I was like, what is going on here? Like we are, 14 to what 18 years old like 
why are we having such bigger issues with each other for no reason, really? It's just because of who we are. And I, I've always known that as a, as a woman, I'm always going to be at risk of higher <laughs> attack in some capacity. And I mean, that was something I was talking at my house too. Like, I don't, I don't think my dad ever hid for me that, oh, as a woman, you're going to face less struggle. Like, I think it, he, he always pushed me to do more things because I need to prove myself as a woman. And I think that was also embedded in me for a long time that I need to push myself to do the extra, um, to prove myself, not because I'm not worthy of it, but to, I need to show that I, I can do something. And then when I came to high school, college, I, I guess I didn't expect how bad it could get because I thought like, oh, I went to high school, it was the worst it could be. Uh, but then coming to a place that wasn't as diverse, um, it kind of tripled it tenfold. Like it was, it was much worse. And things that probably weren't personal felt personal. Um, and that made my first year hard. Like, and that was before all of the getting super involved or the advocacy and like really putting my name out there on campus happened. Like as a first year, just being and existing um, was a challenge within itself um, because of something I couldn't change, my identity. And then once I started getting in these leadership roles, I mean, I always felt like people doubted me just to doubt me. <laughs> like, no, I could do everything and I could have the greatest thing on paper, but again, having to prove myself to, through that. And I think when it really like hurt me, it took a toll on me because I grew, you know, you grow through these things again. Once I learned that everyone's going to like me, I was able to soar. Like you, you learn certain things, but I thought I got past it. And then when I ran for president, that was when I think it really started affecting me. And um, when I ran for president, there was the whole issue with Fizz um, as an anonymous app. I saw a lot of things about me on there, about my identity again and who I am and this girl with long nails gotta be from the ghetto and like just stuff like that. Like that really did hurt me. I wish I could sit here and say, oh my God, I didn't care. Like I wish I could be that person, but I, I wasn't. Um, and that really upset me because it showed me that I understand it's not everyone. And I understand it's not, it's not the whole student body that feels that way. Cause I was still elected somehow. So I can't be everybody. You are. <laughs> but yes, but you are. It, it doesn't take away that like a, f a few, if we're going to say it's a few people like can still, hurt you and I, I want I always try to validate my own feelings there because I think something I heard a lot in that time by people who were trying to help me was like it's not everyone but that doesn't mean it doesn't matter because it's still hurting my feelings <laughs> so that was when I first started realizing like oh dang like the world is tough because I'm a woman of color like that was when I, I started saying that a lot after that point that like oh, I'm treated the way I'm treating some woman of color <laughs> like, like because that that just became a thing all the time and I mean, I always felt like I had a community that backed me, sure. But then again, once I won, I felt such a disconnect with everyone, like my own community, people I considered friends, anyone around me. I just felt a disconnect, Not again, not because they actively did anything that made me feel that way, but I just felt like I wasn't connecting with anyone um, because I was doing different things and time was always an issue. Um, but I, I learned like in this journey and I think like as a woman of color and like leadership roles and whatever, like it, it can get lonely. And like, I admitted to myself, like, yes, it's okay to be lonely, but like, again, acknowledging, yeah, this is one of the, like the loneliest things you can do, <laughs> like be in roles like this, um, as the person you are. And like, sometimes I do compare myself, like I, I've seen other presidents before me, not even just presidents, just people doing the work, doing the thing. Um, but as men, and it doesn't seem like it happens to men as much. And even if it's men of color, it doesn't happen to them as much. And, um, white women, like it doesn't happen to them as much. I start witnessing that and I start comparing it. And, um, again, my whole thing is always, oh, it's because I'm a woman of color. I know it's not true all the time, but it feels, it feels like that sometimes because of these experiences. Um, but yeah, that's something I, I think I'm going to have to work through going forward <laughs> because it's something I think about now, like, yes, it was an issue a lot in the past year, but um, I consider how it's going to impact me like once I'm in the outside world, as everyone says, and in my adult life and in my big girl job and whatever, um, how it'll impact me then. Um, so I'm actually glad I'm going through it now um, 
to learn a bit more before I just like have a crisis soon. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you for all that you've shared. And, you know, we've had several conversations about all that you've shared, but also thank you for sharing that on this platform because I truly believe that someone needed to hear that, right? Because sometimes, first of all, you make it look good, right? <laughs> you make you. it look good. So you don't you don't try, you're doing. I'm you're doing. actively doing, try, do. right? Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Um, but you make it look good. So sometimes people can confuse, you know, when things look good, they take it for face value. So a lot of what you just shared, I'm sure no one had any idea unless they were close to you, unless you, you know, were vulnerable in these spaces with individuals. But because you go out there, you show up and you show out, but it's very hard. It's very challenging. And not everybody can do it. And I truly believe that it takes special people to really do this work and to do this work well. Um, And with that said, you know, I'm thinking about what advice would you give um, to women of color, specifically as you spoke really heavily about um, some of the challenges that you face as a woman of color in leadership roles um, who want to be more actively involved in advocating for diversity, equity and inclusion. But they might not know where to start. They might be apprehensive because they feel how you feel. Right. They feel like that before even getting into it. Um, and they know that the work is hard, but they, but they feel called and there's like a, there's something maybe pulling at their heartstrings. Right. Um, what advice would you give? Yeah. And I think I was that person too. Like I always, again, I said before I wait emotional about things. Like when things happen, I like will cry about it. It's not even my situation, um, because of that calling to do it. Um, and I think what got me to do it and something I would share with another that wanted to, um, is find like the pieces of it that you are really passionate about. Like what are the topics within advocacy work that really like call you and that you do want to work on? Um, I think having mentors is really important. Like being able to have people that you can talk to about these things. Like I know, again, we're acknowledging, I talked to you a bunch about all of these things. Um, And even when like, you know, we had a conversation about like being the first of something and the challenges within that. And, having those mentorships and people you can share those honest feelings with, it means a lot. Um, and one thing I also valued when I, when I started here from my sophomore year onward, I made sure that every semester I had one faculty of color teaching me because (laughs) it made a big difference to have somebody that you can connect to in that way. And in the predominantly white campus that Fairfield is having those avenues means everything. Like I can sit in a meeting all day with whoever and then I like get in a meeting with like Kalisha Johnson and I'm like, oh my God, I feel like you could like let down. And I feel like when you have those people to help guide you in your thoughts, like it it makes such a difference in your daily life. And so if I could give any suggestion, it would be to find those people you can share with. It doesn't have to be even a staff or faculty member, it could be another student. Like who are those people you can confide in about? what you're passionate about and what you want to do and people who can give you advice and things like that, I think is so important in your journey because having people behind you is everything. Like, I don't think I could have done it without certain people with me all the time. And like, again, I always say like a simple, how are you is so meaningful. So like, even if I like come into the SDMA and like someone in the office greets me and says like, Hey, how are you? Like, you're doing good. And I'm like, wow, that's it. That's all I needed for the day to like have the motivation. So somewhere to just let down your hair in essence and talk about what you want to do and accomplish and things like that. I think bigger conversations are so important, like deep conversations. Like I always say, like, if I'm going to sit down and gossip with somebody, I don't want to do it. Like I I really value like intense, deep dialogue all the time in my daily life. And um, I think when you find that piece and find what is driving you to feel that calling and you do the observation and you observe what you want to do, like you can do it. And I mean, again, this is, this is life. Like we're always going to face our own battle of being women of color anywhere we go. So whether it's in college or it's when we like hit the workplace finally or whatever we're doing after, like we're going to face it eventually. Like we're going to have to not suck it up, but the pain that will come eventually, it might not. But if it was to, it's good to kind of, I feel like learn that skill and learn how to build yourself in resilience and integrity and things like that. Now I feel like this is the best age. It's like developmental time. Um, So I feel like always knowing that you're going to get something out of every experience is important. Um, And honestly, I think it's what you make of it, too. So, like, if you want to get involved here at Fairfield, anywhere else, um, what you want of it is what you'll make of it. So I I never want, and I I always tell this people, too, I never want something that feels like a limitation to hold you back from trying. Um, 
you could do it once. If you hate it, you hate it. You could go. But, like, you never know until you do it. So. Absolutely. And that, that's definitely great advice. And as I think about your journey, as we have mentioned earlier, um, you took that year pretty much to observe, yes. right? Because you were pretty much figuring out where am I going to start, right? So when you talk, when you spoke about being able to, to um, have conversations and, you know, all that other stuff, that was part of your, your observation, right? And then you were like, okay, this is what needs to be changed. This is what I need to do. And this is how I'm going to do it. So you, whether you realized it or not, you had a game plan. You might not have realized to say, I'm going to observe Absolutely, you know. my first year and then sophomore year, I'm going to become, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, but that's what you did. And, and you're, you know, the first year was really you figuring out where your place is and, and, and what is your calling and what is your purpose and not knowing. I always say that there's power in not knowing, right? Because you don't know in that immediate moment, but you've gathered it. And then you're like, okay, this is what I need to do. Yes. But you took the time yeah. to observe. And I like that, that finding your purpose. That's something I'm so, so big on when I was teaching FYE first year experience and I taught a classroom of black and brown students because I did the academic immersion program at company scholars and teaching those students meant a lot to me because that I wish I was that person like when I was a first year student like I wish I had someone not exactly like me but somebody that could have guided me that was like me and that was what changed everything for me like that purpose like finding your purpose and like I had that spark like early sophomore year that like oh no like I have to be here to help other underrepresented students and like then that translated me for life like I need to help support underserved communities for the rest of my life like there was there was some type of like epiphany that came that was like this is it so I think that finding that purpose is like so 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 important absolutely and now um well, thinking about looking forward and moving forward what are your hopes and aspirations for the future of diversity equity and inclusion particularly as it pertains to women's involvement and we spoke a bit about that leadership capacity too right because we spoke about how you've been in multiple leadership capacities leading up to your presidency of fusa right now as well so what are some of your hopes and aspirations yeah i i said this when i won like i hope there's a day. Obviously, I'm all about celebrating the first. But I hope there's a day that there isn't more first. <laughs> like, the day we can say everyone's consumed the space and we are making our, you know, making our space known, too. Like, we're here. Like, this is our school, too. Like, and again, it goes beyond just Fairfield just holding that leadership um, role in any capacity. Um, but I feel like a day we could say, like, okay, we don't have to think about the first of something anymore. Like, I feel like we... Not that we made it, but we were making that difference that we wanted this whole time. Like, we want there to be people in these seats and doing these things and not being so behind the scenes. Like, be forward like and, and face it. And that would, I think when I see that day, I'll be happy. I don't know if I'll see that day. <laughs> but, but Hopes and aspirations, yeah, okay? We yeah. have to continue to be hopeful yes. because without hope, what do we have, right? Right, but that's, that was something I always, always say um, when it comes to this work. I, I just really want, like, it kind of goes back to what I said about that advice piece before with for, like, younger women of color. I don't want there to be limitations because of identity. Because identity is something we can't, we can't change. Like, we are who we are, so we have to own it. Um, and know that if we don't make it do what we got to do for ourselves, like, who's going to do it for us? And it's like a self-love thing that goes in there, too, a little bit. Like, we have to give it to ourselves because no one owes us nothing. We can't we know how the world treats us. Like we can't expect anything. Um, but I would love to see that day. And I would love, um, within FUSA, like something I've been very intentional about this year is like creating that space for students, like in FUSA as a whole, and that it doesn't have to be president or director of anything. If just serving us a, a smaller position, I think I, I really wanted more students to be involved in it. That were students of color, first gen students, commuter students. Like I think this is one of the highest like commuter students populations we've had in FUSA in a long time. And it's just about those little outlets of taking up space too and giving people opportunities to do things that meant a lot for me. So I would love to see people who continue to do that kind of thing. Um, even if it's like having an event and, oh, I want you to come speak at this event because I know you can do it. Like, I, I love giving that space to people and that's been really moving for me. And I, I learned so much from others too. I love, again, I'm a talker, so I love learning from people and their experiences. So I would love to see that continue as well. Like not everything has to always be like me, me, me. Like I love giving that to others. So I, I would love to see that just continue in Fairfield in general, FUSA, other student organizations, always giving people the platform. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. 
Um, and, and I just really loved what you said about not having to like say the first of when it pertains to identity specifically, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that means that everyone has had an opportunity to, you know, take up space, right? Um, and occupy that space more so. Um, and yes, and something that I'm reflecting on uh, that you said is that we have to own that, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that you just mentioned. So before we close, um, I want you to take this time <laughs> to brag about yourself and share with us some of the things that you're doing or you have accomplished recently. And when I say brag, uh, I mean give kudos or props to yourself for all the things that you are doing. Because as women, we tend to overlook or downplay our successes, but I truly want us to brag. Um, Oftentimes bragging has a negative connotation, but in reality, it involves emphasizing the celebration, like you mentioned earlier, right, of our achievements and highlighting skills and accomplishments and fostering a sense of pride. So brag. <laughs> so I like that you said that last part because I don't like talking about myself and I don't like the brag because of the negative connotation it gives. Um, and even like, in, in the context of bragging about things, of accomplishments and things like that, something I also always consider is like validating feelings too. Like I feel like I should, sometimes I'm always like, oh dang, I can't feel like that because of this. But like, no, I could validate my feelings. So I feel like bragging about yourself is just validating your feelings. Um, but, um, well, I am proud to be the first like woman of color, like future president, like, oh, I look glitz and glam. But I I am proud of it. I, it took me so, like, long to absorb what everyone told me. Like, when I went, like, oh, my God, Christ, you're the first. Like, blah, blah, blah. like, I didn't really, like, process it until way after the fact. Like, this past, like, last semester, maybe. Um, it, it meant a lot to me because I think of the other first that I was exposed to in FUSA. So, you know, like, Karen Donahue was the first female president um and then like toby and Vinny were the first men like men of color who were a duo um and seeing them was really inspiring for me and i th always think about how they were like not the sole reason but a big part of why i even joined fuse in the first place so i i always think to myself as the first woman of color how another young female student might think of me or see themselves in me and that's the purpose like that is why I do these things and that representation how much it matters I always say that um but that's that's one thing I will I'll brag about <laughs> like feeling accomplished in that respect I mean I didn't I didn't come to Fairfield and be like oh I'm gonna be the president of my senior year like absolutely not but that that was a good that's like that's my top brag um but the other one is the journey of, of Fairfield like obviously as a senior now I've been reflecting so much on my time here and this like Again, there's a lot of things people don't know, but like, I don't, I wouldn't present myself in a certain way. But there was a point where I was, I, I just like probably shouldn't have been here anymore. Like, I was not doing well in many respects. I, I wasn't mentally well. I, I wanted to go home. I wasn't doing well academically. Like, there were the, those those times that most people would probably never figure. Um, and I'm so happy that I got through that. Like. My first and a half year, I would say, I was really struggling and consistently, like obviously we have our struggle points anytime, but I was consistently struggling. And I never thought that that would equate to me being where I am now. And I think that growth meant the world to me. Like that, I, I can't believe, even now I'm like in shock. And with that growth, one of the first times I felt like I was really proud of myself. And I, I never say that, like, oh, I'm proud of myself. Never say that. But I actually like felt it was during winter break when I mean I got acceptance to almost every grad school I applied to. And like that was something I never, like I did not foresee that happening at all. I was actually very stressed out about it because I'm like, I know school's gonna accept me. And most people again probably wouldn't think that I have that worry. Um but I I really struggled at Fairfield when it came to beyond the the leadership. I'll say that. Um and education being such a big part of my life and my family's life and that equating to success and accomplishment like doing well in school that's always what it's been in my household and to say like oh I got into all these schools and like that was a moment for me of like oh my god wow like this is what I wanted to do my whole life like I wanted to be a good student more than anything and so 
to have that was so validating of like myself and like my young, like literally when they say like, oh, you talk to like yourself as a child, like that's what that was for me. So that's something I'm very proud of as well. Um, but yeah, the journey, being a future president, like accomplishment from there, what's happening next. Like these are things I, I don't share because like, I don't, I don't like to share. Like, but not, not that I don't like to, but again, that bragging, like I, I feel like I'm, I don't know. I'm like, oh my God, I don't want anyone to think like I'm putting all my business on them. But yeah, I am I am happy right now. <laughs> As you should be. And you've done such incredible work. You've done absolutely amazing things. And I'm hoping that moving forward, you do brag, you know, because just because you want you brag about the great things that you do does not mean that you're putting anyone else down and it doesn't make you better than and it doesn't make anyone else any less than. But we should, as you were talking about unity, um, mm -hmm. the unity series, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about celebration oh, and celebrating yeah. everyone else. But really, we want to look inward and we want to move all that inward, too. When we talk about celebrating our own accomplishments, like, wow, I did that. Mm -hmm. Like, I am the first Mm -hmm. I'm the first. And every time you say it, I'm like, say it a little bit louder. Yeah, say it a little bit louder, yeah. right? Because, again, people can be your biggest cheerleaders, but at the end of the day, you should be a huge cheerleader of the yourself. Self -care. Exactly, the self-care. Exactly, right? Side, yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that moving forward, you love on yourself and you celebrate your accomplishments just the same way that you celebrate the accomplishments of others. Um, and you have to pour into yourself, just making sure yeah. that you're pouring into yourself. So thank you for bragging on this platform. Thank you for letting me. For, I never thought I would. <laughs> for some of the few great things that you're doing, because I know we can be here until next week talking right, about right. all the amazing things <laughs> that you're doing truly and honestly um, in the community, around the community for individuals. And I know that during your time here at Fear Food, there has been countless individuals who have been blessed just by your presence, just by your advocacy, just by everything that you have done and continue to do and the space that you're providing for people. So something that I know that has been really important for you is to pave the way for others, you know, um, and I can say that you truly have been doing that in one way, shape or form um, and truly been a part of this journey to move the university forward. So thank you. Um, and thank you again, as I mentioned, for joining us. Um, thank you to all the viewers for tuning in. I'm Yulema Felican, and this is the Diversity in Action podcast.